I've been looking at the work of Zeynep Tufeki, American academic who's come up with the concept of surveillance capitalism. This is a category that looks at Facebook and Twitter, other social media. She points out that enormous brain power and research goes into designing these products, which look quite naive. They look very innocent, and though they've um, been designed by people who probably only just turned on a computer, they look so simple and, in a way, deliberately low-tech. According to Zenep, it's a highly scientific process with lots of real-time and dynamic testing of how behaviour can be, can be influenced. So if you're on Facebook, it's quite likely that you're in a sample set that is testing ways of keeping you on the site to direct you deeper and deeper into the site because as she points over and over as she points out over and over again the whole of these systems aim to first of all attract your attention and above all keep your attention and the the sort of negative effects we've seen from facebook are largely to do with this this way of making the site more and more sticky the desire to keep keep people confused and intrigued and offering them more and more narrow material, uh, going deeply within the original interest that brought them to Facebook, is really the key to it. It's very, very different to most types of old media. So we have a business model which is set to figure out exactly how to press our buttons, uh, she uses that phrase, our psychological buttons, to stimulate our interest. And does this by using an enormous amount of data that is captured asymmetrically, meaning they know a lot about you, but we, the users, know almost nothing about Facebook and how that data that is collected uh, by often by stealth is uh, being used. We never get to see what information is being stored about us or where they are deriving it from or which third parties they are verifying the information against. And a lot of the information that Facebook has does in fact come from third parties. So when you're doing some transaction online, you give a date of birth, maybe even a password that asks for your favourite pet when you're a child, then that fact will be recorded by some other provider, maybe a bank or something like that, and could be sold to Facebook. So they, they cross-verify your favourite pet with their other data, and then they're certain they know about your pet buying behaviour when you're a child. And that is an example of part of a, a devastatingly deep and accurate profile they will have on you so that they can sell your time and attention to advertisers. She gives the example of um, somebody who's a manic depressive who is inclined to go on spending splurges when they are on and up. Well, it'd be quite easy for Facebook using the types of data collection methods they have to detect such people and inform advertisers when they are more susceptible to buy things than they otherwise would be. Targeting people with psychiatric problems or, or moods, just, just ordinary moods within the normal, healthy um, human spectrum, uh, seems very, very sinister, and there's all kinds of ethical problems with it, but the problems could be greater uh, when we look at the political zone and the security state um, aspects of this type of monitoring. But at stage one of the development of a security state, a mass surveillance state, would be phone tapping, for example, which has gone on since the invention of the telephone. But it was really impossible for the authorities to listen to everything. They could collect the data, but then analysts had to sit and listen to it and decide what was important. It began to be automated 20 or 30 years ago with uh, technology that could de detect key words uh, and then that would turn the tapping system on or off or alert analysts to the important bits of the tape. Some of these things went wrong about 10 or 20 years ago when, you know, kids who were talking online on phones were just boasting about violent acts and then they would get raids from the police triggered by that. Things have moved on since those days, however. Um, it's now very easy... Uh, to devise um, algorithms that scan vast amounts of uh, email messages, for example, or text messages or chat online um, via Facebook um, or just in chat rooms to add that to the profile of people as well as trigger emergency alerts. So in the age of the phone tap, it was really impossible for the authorities to listen to everything. 
However, once a dynamic profile starts to be built up, it's easier to target persons of interest and follow them more thoroughly. The action of profiling and targeting will produce more data and more inference and more valid inferences and the pattern for testing in the machine learning model. It's become easy to build a model which enables people to be targeted with messages about their fears and anxieties in the domain of politics. And these can be linked to life events. This is already happening in politics, but not openly. It's happening person by person, and it's invisible to people who are not involved, except for the fact that the messages are being received. This whole process of building fear profiles of people, which can be addressed by politicians, is invisible. It's largely invisible. You don't know that it's going on. The incoming collection of the data to find the phobias and the target people and list of those people is more important than when the messages are sent might notice the messages going out, although they're very narrow casts, so if you're not on the list, you probably won't see them. But more significance is the accuracy and depth of knowledge about the people who are being targeted. In terms of democracy and electoral politics, the issue is voter suppression. You are not using these methods primarily to increase your own vote or to motivate your own supporters. They're all pretty motivated anyway. The idea is to find the fears of potential voters about your rivals and emphasise those fears to prevent them voting for your rivals. As Feyner puts it, it's happening in the dark. You don't see what other people are seeing. Now, there's a huge irony in this, according to Feyner, that this technology and these ways of working come from the ultra-liberal culture of California and of Silicon Valley. So these um, ultra-liberal people are in fact building a machine for consumerism which can be used by authoritarians. And the optimistic liberals, the innovators, the highly capable people think they will never lose control of it. But what they're doing all the time is simplifying it so, uh, you know, brutal people, idiots, can use the same technology. And this is the lesson of history that um, liberal-minded, scientific innovators and developers create products for or utopian reasons. But this, this technology, once it's working, can easily be taken over by authoritarians for negative purposes. And so this brings us to Donald Trump and the whole argument last year over fake news. Trump's social media campaign, the output ranged from distortion to outright fakes in his own name. More important were the comments and further exaggerations made by supporters in the echo chamber effect. So they were targeting people with specific fears, sending them made up messages. And these people would add some disinformation of their own and then retweet it all around uh, the Internet or share it with friends. Unless you were a Trump supporter or rather unless the machine learning on Facebook had profiled you as a Trump supporter, you would never see these comments and you would have to hunt them down. It'd be quite hard to find. The algorithms now are so good at showing you or giving you what you want so they will know what your political views are uh, because you can infer these from a data set that includes your level of education, whereabouts in the country you live, your purchasing patterns, whether you've you like classical music or pop music, or, or whether you like country and western music or rap music, anything that you've bought online through a service like Amazon, most likely that data has been shared with somebody like Facebook for verification purposes. So they know who you are, and they will only send you things that, um, that you really like. And consumers like that, they find that service very useful. So every time they buy something that's been suggested, this is further verification. It's fed into a machine learning model and the system becomes more accurate. But as you get deeper within this furrow that uh, you're digging for yourself into your own particular lifestyle, which you enjoy, it becomes harder and harder to see similar furrows uh, that have been created for other people and other types of people. The thing that drives all of this is Facebook's desire for you to have a pleasant experience online. So the things you read about in the sphere of politics, they're all likely to come from the same sources and they're all likely to agree with you because this is pleasing. You will be confirmed in your view and all the criticism will just seem funny or ridiculous to you. Phillips says Facebook gives its users a diet of sugar and salt. The sugar is all the cute material 
cuddly animals, birthday reminders. All of this is pleasant. All of this keeps you online more and more because you have to send the congratulation message. It comes back. And all this time, even fractions of seconds, adds up to millions or perhaps tens of millions if they adjust the operating system so it just keeps everybody online. Think of a new thing. Keep you online just for a few seconds. On Twitter, for example, the on Twitter, for example, the number of shares and notifications that pop up pop up a few seconds after you log on. That's just to keep you on there to wait to see whether you've got any new updates or notifications or retweets. And also to give it the feel of um, like a slot machine that you pull the arm and wait and see what happened uh, to your tweet. They could give them instantaneously, but they don't because they, they realize, first of all, those fractions of seconds you have to wait to get that data or a- aggregate and make money. And also the whole experience of having to wait a moment, a little buzz, a little thrill of waiting to see what you get. People really like it. But the salt is equally enjoyable. This is really the tabloid brew of things you can be angry about. Disgusting things, horrific things, or things you can feel self-righteous about. So both sides, both these polar sides, the sugar and the salt, attract attention. So that's the Facebook model. They feed you a diet of sugar and salt. And this can be dangerous because if in your real diet you have lots of salt, this is bad for you, but it can change your taste buds so that ordinary news tastes unpalatable. It's boring. It's It seems um, biased towards some sort of establishment. You know, you crave that salt. You want more shock horror. You want more things to be angry about, more things to disapprove of. And this keeps you online, sharing things, signaling your own virtue in relation to these events and just generally making lots more money for Facebook because every second you're online, the advertising value of the page you're looking at goes up. In the domain of politics, Finnup says it was the Obama campaign that started it. It was the first major political campaign in the West to use Facebook effectively and to understand how it worked and to lead with it. Until quite recently, other political campaigns were leading with the old-fashioned media, with television, and then using Facebook as a support service. From the Obama campaign onwards, successful campaigns have started with social media, and they've only used uh, old-style media, such as television clips, as brief uh, bits of content which can be used on Facebook. In 2016... Trump's operation wasn't very sophisticated to begin with. When Trump knocked Cruz out of the race for the Republican nomination, all the Cruz data people ended up working for Donald Trump and they brought with them very sophisticated Facebook profiling, individual psychological profiles for individual voters based on Facebook likes. Uh, But with a high degree of probability that these psychological profiles are based on the scale of five major personality traits, extrovert versus introvert, etc., etc. Also, Facebook can easily guess sexual orientation and religious affiliation, even if you never disclose them. They will infer them from other open source data and your viewing behavior online and your purchasing behavior. We know that some people will vote for more authoritarian politics if they are scared. So you can target the people who are more likely um, to respond to um, exaggeration and scare stories in order to not to get them on your side, but to uh, deter them from voting for something that might turn out bad. On the other hand, other types of Facebook users are antagonized by scaremongering. Their psychological profile will indicate it scaremongering will not work with them and may in fact encourage them. Now we saw uh, encourage them to vote for your opponent. We might have seen some of this during the Jeremy Corbyn, uh, Theresa May election 2017 in England where they w- the Conservative Party was doing a lot of negative stuff on Facebook about how awful and how terrible, how frightening life would be um, under Jeremy Corbyn. But it does seem that these were not hermetically sealed in to the target audience of people who would respond to that, the people with introvert personality types, the people who respond well to scare. Um, Many of them leaked out 
to like young go-getters who you know, like to live dangerously, I suppose, in some sense. It backfired by motivating them to vote against safety because that was their psychological profile. There are such people and Facebook knows who they are. The problem is that if you put out scaremongering material aimed at the general public or even a fairly narrow demographic, the sort of demographic you get with newspapers or television advertising, the votes you gain by spending money on scaremongering in that media uh, will be offset to some degree by the voters who are mobilised by dislike of the scaremongering. But if you can go online and target an audience that is only influenced by fearmongering, this is much more efficient. You get a much bigger bang for your buck.